appreciate Brad leading our prayer this morning and Paul our scripture reading. I did want to mention that Brad will be our speaker this evening, so I want to encourage you all to come back, if at all possible, and share in another study of God's Word. And uh, this evening, I believe Dennis will be our song leader as our young men <laughs> lead our service. That ought to make you feel good, Dennis. Uh, Brad, uh, I guess you still qualify as a young man. I'm not really sure about Dennis. I guess uh, if he's on the schedule, he must. We have a lot of people traveling today, if you've noticed. Uh, some of our families are out of town. We also have a few that are under the weather and some who are recovering, and we're grateful for those who are improving and pray that that continues. I wanted to share with you, uh, in conjunction with our reading this morning, Proverbs 27, verse 1. Solomon wrote, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The essence of that statement is encapsulated in the passage from James that was shared a moment ago. Neither passage in any way implies that we should not look to the future, that we should not lay plans for tomorrow and next week and next year. But I believe what both clearly indicate is that we must always make our plans with the understanding that we really are not in charge that God is, and we sung a hymn already this morning that clearly conveyed that message. We simply do not know what tomorrow may hold for any of us. I spent just a few minutes this past week looking at headlines, and among them were the following. Indonesian tsunami, death toll rises to 373 amid fears that Krakatoa could trigger another wave any time. Authorities in Northern California launched a dragnet Wednesday after a police officer was shot and killed during a routine traffic stop. Tragic, tragic story. A Georgia father charged in connection with the death of his two children, reportedly worked as a Santa at a local Walmart in the days leading up to his arrest. And four young men, all under the age of 25, died in a tragic accident Christmas morning on the Garden State Parkway in New Jersey. One was a Marine, two were brothers in that tragic accident. They simply rear-ended a slow-moving tanker truck uh, there on the highway. That's just a sampling of the kinds of stories that we encounter every day. And some of us, I suspect, breathe a sigh of relief that those involved are not in some way connected to us that we essentially escaped while others did not. But as I come before you today, I, I come before you with the very simple understanding that uh, in this life there are no guarantees, that we never know what the future may hold. And though these, these headlines were all very negative in their makeup, good things also happen, and yet, we tend not to notice them or remember them. But the future is, to a great extent, of our own making. We know that there will be times of joy and times of great sadness. What we don't know and what we can choose is how we react during those times. Life is filled with uncertainty. Tomorrow does not come with a promise that all will be well in our lives. In fact, what we do know is that ultimately our fate is death. 
But as Christians, we accept that faith with the realization that for us, what lies on the other side is so much better than anything we can experience in this realm. People don't like to talk about death, especially their own, but it is a reality of life. In Genesis 5, there's that repeated refrain, if you go back and read the text, that begins with Adam, and all the days of Adam were 930 years, and he died. I happen to find that personally reassuring. As I believe I've said in your presence before, I would find it extremely disheartening to think that life just continued on and on and on, that I grew older and weaker and more frail with the passing of every day. I'm glad that God has given us, if you please, an out, that this world and this life will end and something far better and grander awaits us on the other side. And knowing that, I also know what so many in our world do not know, but I suspect you know today. It is not the quantity of life we live, but the quality of that life that matters. It doesn't really make a big difference if we are in Christ, whether we live a long life or a short life, as long as we live for our Lord, we can say with the Apostle Paul, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I confront life, death, and eternity in my line of work in a way that most of you probably cannot relate. I deal with grieving families, it seems like, all the time. And to many of them, there's little hope that I can offer because they've lived their lives or their loved one has lived his life or her life without any regard for eternity, with any, without any thought for God and Christ and what lies ahead. And I can't offer a great deal of hope or encouragement in those settings, but for those who live the life that a Christian is called to live. And how many times? Have we, as God's family on this corner, mourned the passing of someone that we've known and loved as a faithful brother or sister in Christ, as a devoted servant of God, and knew in our heart of hearts that for them what awaited was far better than what they left behind? This is the message that we bring to this setting every time we assemble. As Christians, we have hope in what is otherwise a hopeless world. And though the world may feel desperate and in despair, we know that God has not abandoned us. That it can be well with our soul, no matter what the future holds. I can't tell you with any degree of certainty what lies ahead. But I can tell you with absolute confidence, whatever it is, you don't have to face it alone. And whatever it is, it will not overwhelm you unless you allow that to happen. Because we have the promise of our Savior, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That enables us to say boldly, we will not fear what men may do unto us. And ultimately, will assert with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so as I look at this passage in James chapter 4, I'm reminded that it is right and proper for us to plan ahead, to look to the future, but always to do so with the understanding that God is in control and it is not our will, but His will, which must be be done. That being said, I want to call your attention to a couple of passages that offer a very solemn warning to us. The first is in Genesis 27, specifically verse 2, but I want to set the stage for you. It is in the, the days of Isaac and Rebekah. Their boys, Jacob and Esau, are growing up before their eyes. Isaac is up in years. In fact, he's at that stage in his life when he can no longer see. 
he summons his favorite son Esau and makes this statement to him. Behold now, I am old and I know not the day of my death. And then he made a request, as though he were to say, Before I die, I have one last thing to ask of you, and then I will bless you. I crave a meal of venison. You're a skillful hunter. Go forth. Harvest the game. Prepare the meal, and when I've eaten, I will bless you and I will die. You know the story and how it played out and ultimately Jacob and Esau were separated for a period of 20 years and Jacob left home under threat of death from his elder brother Esau. They were twins of course and Esau was only slightly older but it didn't matter, it still doesn't if you know twins today. And he was entitled to the father's blessing and daddy said, it's drawing near. Life is about to close. This is my final request before the blessing is bestowed. And I read that and I don't really focus always on the story and how it played out and how God used Jacob in a powerful way as the nucleus for the nation of Israel. I think only of that exchange between Isaac and his son Esau and how relevant at some point that is for all of us because if we're lucky we'll live to a ripe old age and we'll experience in our bodies the process of aging that means the dimming of sight and the loss of hearing and the weakness of our muscles and the limitations of our movements all of those things and we'll say with Isaac I'm old I'm going to die soon I don't know when, but it's going to happen. Because that's really true of all of us, isn't it? But, and this is key, if we are Christians, that's a good thing. And nothing to fear. Death is never more than a few feet away. Which leads me to the second story that I want to share with you. It is in 1 Samuel chapter 20, specifically verse 3, but it revolves around David and his relationship with King Saul. David is the military leader of Israel's army under the direction of her king, Saul. He's highly skilled. He experiences victory after victory, leading the people of God against her enemies, leading the women of the land to sing David and Saul have slain thousands. Saul his thousands and David his tens of thousands. It should have been cause for both to rejoice that God was working for and through them to deliver the nation of Israel. But Saul was envious of his general and time after time sought to take David's life. David had built a very close relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan. And the situation had gotten so bad that David knew that it was time, as we would say, to get out of Dodge. He had to leave town or Saul was going to kill him. So he summoned his dear friend, Jonathan. And here's the statement that David made to him. Truly, as the Lord lives... And as your, your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. I understand again the context. But I believe that the statement is just as valid for any of us as it was for King David then, or for David then, as King Saul sought to take his life. I'm not aware of anyone out to take my life or yours today, but I also know how precious life is, how precarious it is, and how close we are every day to seeing it in. Have you prepared? Are you ready? 
because the Bible's really filled with warnings speaking to the urgency of living life in preparation for the life that lies on the other side. Moses wrote but one psalm, the 90th, and in it he likened life to a tale that is told, a short story that starts and ends so quickly that it's over before it's begun. He says, the days of our years are three score and ten. That's a fancy way of saying seventy. And if by reason of strength they be eighty, they are soon cut off and we fly away. Some of us are getting closer to that three and score and ten than we'd like to admit, aren't we? And some have already long passed it. But the fact of the matter is, no matter what our age, young, middle-aged, elderly, there's a step between us and death. And we need to be ready. Our text simply likens life to a puff of smoke that appears one moment and has vanished the next. That's J.B. Phillips' translation of James 4.14. The King James says it's a vapor literally, a puff of smoke. One moment you see it, the next it's gone. Yet it does not cease to exist. You see, from a Christian perspective, there's only been a change in residency. As we leave the earthly material realm and enter into the spiritual, it is imperative. I don't know what happened there, but it's imperative that we understand the nature of this message conveyed by James and what it says to us as Christians about life's uncertainties. We're back. Hit the wrong button. Not even sure which one I hit. You remember the song that Tim McGraw used to sing? We ought to live each day like we're dying. I've never been a big country western fan, but I have a family, they all are, and so I'm exposed to this stuff uh, routinely nearly every day. And much of it I don't even understand. I have to go back to the 50s to even understand the words in most songs anymore. But once in a while I'll hear something that really resonates with me, and I like the message of that song. Live like you were dying. Because I think that's exactly what the scriptures teach us. Every day is a precious gift. It's hinted in the middle of the Bible, that's the 118th Psalm, in the middle verse. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Today's a gift. Somebody says that's why we call it the present. It's a gift to be used, and used well. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, and have it more abundantly. Every day, as a child of God, I ought to get up and thank God that I've been given another day to use to His glory, to seize and use in ways that bring about good in the lives of the people around me. I don't know what the day will hold, but I know it's a gift from God, and I need to use it and use it well. Believing that God is in charge, I know that whatever life brings, out of it, great good can come. Some of the greatest tragedies in life may result in tremendous good when fully understood. you look back over history, some of the lowest points in the history of human civilization ultimately led to some of the greatest triumphs. Victory over Nazism. Victory over Japan. What a transformation occurred in our world, and in those two nations in particular. But what a terrible thing to go through a world war, ultimately reach victory and turn enemies into friends. That's on a grand, broad scale. 
May I suggest there are little things in our lives every day that happen that can either produce great good or much harm, depending on how we respond to them. As I remind you frequently, and, and Brad even intimated in his prayer this morning, that we come here carrying all kinds of burdens. For some, the holidays are really difficult. They have no one or almost no one. Life can be hard. But then we come to a setting like this and remind ourselves, if we're thinking clearly, we're not alone. We're part of something much bigger than ourselves. We're part of God's family. And if no one else cares, He does. And He will always be there for us. Some hearts are heavy because of the loss of loved ones. Others are dealing with sickness and disease. And some, why they're on the mountaintop. Life couldn't be better. All is well, and there are folks scattered everywhere in between, from the deepest valley to the highest mountaintop. But God's in charge, and wherever you find yourself in life, the goal ought to be that expressed by Paul in Romans 8. We know that to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose, that all things ultimately work together for good. I don't have to know the future when I know who holds the future in His hands. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 through chapter 5 verse 2, Paul writes to pick the spirits of the saints at Corinth up. And in doing so, he makes observations that should be apparent to all of us, that our outward man is perishing. That is, the process of life, birth, life, death, from cradle to grave is very normal and natural. Our physical bodies, the houses of our true selves, are designed by God to age. That's our outward man, and it perishes. But he says, though our outward man perishes, our inner man is being renewed day by day. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Why do we need the focus that he brings us to? A focus on what can't be seen as opposed to what can be seen. Because what you see is only temporary. What you can't see is eternal. And he says, we look at our bodies, we can see, and we know what's happening. But our real focus ought to be on the inner man, the inner person, that part of us made in the image of God that is perpetually young and vibrant, alive. And know that when our earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We sometimes sing that song. That includes the refrain, I know who holds tomorrow. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. It's actually, I think, 319 in our songbook, but Tim couldn't find it, so it may be in another songbook. But it's such a powerful message. It's the one that James is conveying in James chapter 4. He said, you plan for the future. You look ahead. You have lofty goals. But know that at any moment they can be interrupted. So make your plans with God's will in mind. And know whatever happens, it cannot overwhelm you unless you permit it to overwhelm you, that God will never give you anything too great for you to bear, no burden too heavy to be borne. But you have to trust Him. You see, we're here today because we have a different outlook than the world. We really believe that 
there's something better than what this life has to offer. And we're here today preparing for what lies ahead. And I was sitting beside Bill this morning as we were singing and thinking about the simplicity of our worship. At the Lord's table, we gave thanks for unleavened bread and grape juice. They serve as a reminder of God's great love for us and how he willingly dispatched his son from heaven to earth to be our redeemer. It's such a simple thing, but has such profound meaning. I must never, never, never forget. God loves me. Christ died to save me. Heaven is my future as a Christian. We've lifted our voices in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs today. And God has listened and accepted our worship in so many ways, such a little thing, but how uplifting and powerful that is. It has always been, and I suspect will always be, the part of the worship that I look forward to the most and the part that I enjoy the most and maybe the part that I am worst at. But God isn't listening for four-part harmony. He's not focused on hitting every note. He's listening to the expressions of our hearts as we teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing praise to our God and our Redeemer. Every aspect of our worship in its simplicity is designed to draw us closer to each other, closer to our God, and prepare us to go out into this community and live for Him and be an influence to those around, it, around us. Richard, Richard Kipling wrote the poem, If, which contains these lines. I think they're the lines the world embraces as it faces life. In fact, I read just this past week that Warren Buffett uh, attributes these lines to his success. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, if you can wait and not be tired of waiting, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, yours is the earth and everything that is in it. And I would not argue with that but owning the earth and everything that's in it and forgetting God means you're poor in breath, bankrupt in soul, and without hope for eternity. I would like to think that the key to life is knowing God, embracing Christ, and following His glorious will. And when that happens, we still don't know what the future holds. But we know who holds the future, and it will be well with us. I wanted to close this year with a reminder that we come together next Sunday. God willing, it will be a new year that conveys the same promises offers the same hope that every year since has offered. But it also holds the possibility to tragedy, heartbreak, and despair. For some of us, we'll, we'll be on the mountaintop. And for others, we'll hit the depths of Death Valley. There will be good times. There will be bad times. But if we are Christians... It will be well with our soul. 
Are you a child of God? I want you not to leave this year without thinking seriously about your relationship with the Lord and your preparation for eternity. We'll extend to you the invitation we do every Lord's Day at this time. To become a child of God, to leave determined to walk in the steps of Jesus, and to know that, like David of old, there may be a step between us and death, but in Christ, it's okay. Because awaiting us on the other side are the redeemed of all the ages, cheering us on, ready to welcome us home. And you don't want to miss out on that homecoming, and you need not if you'll come to Jesus on his terms as we stand together and sing.